Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is JC Hernandez, and I will be your host for this webinar on the hyper distributed RFID antenna or Hydra system and accompanying low mass antenna technology sponsored by NASA's technology transfer program. As part of my role, I support this program and work with NASA scientists who have developed new technologies that may have applications outside of the aerospace industry. We patent these inventions and market them to industry through our website. Our presenter today is Dr. Patrick W. Fink. Pat has worked at NASA for 33 years, specializing in radio frequency identification, or RFID, computational electromagnetics, and antenna engineering. He's the principal investigator of NASA's realm, RFID enabled autonomous logistics management, experiments on the International Space Station, and is currently enhancing the system for NASA's next generation of remote space habitats. He received an electrical engineering undergraduate degree and a master's in engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. He went on to receive a PhD from the University of Houston. Following today's technical presentation, I will be giving a short overview on how to apply for a license through NASA's technology transfer program. But before we get started, I'd like to point out that your microphones will be muted throughout this presentation. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and we will answer them during the Q&A session at the end. At this point, I am going to turn it over to Pat. Okay, thanks, John, uh, for that introduction. And thanks everybody for taking the time out to uh, join us today. Let me uh, pull up the slides. Okay. and. Um, so this uh, webinar is on what we call a uh, hyper distributed RFID antenna system or Hydra, uh, as well as a uh, low mass antenna that um, we designed to go along with it, although it's uh, not required as we'll, we'll talk about. So this is the uh, agenda uh, for the webinar, um, the, the Hydra system. I'm gonna start with the just real quickly what, what the Hydra is, and then go back and go through some of the motivation why, why we're looking and why we're using Hydra. Uh, the concept and introduction, uh, key benefits, uh, overview of the technology, um, the evolution of Hydra, and then how we're uh, having fused it on our International Space Station. And then after that, I'll talk about the antenna side of this. Um, the Hydra itself is, uh, is not require or doesn't have to be used with any specific antenna. But um, for our application, where we're looking at very low mass, uh, we did uh, develop a specific antenna for it. And uh, then look at some just overall systems and uh, applications and other, uh, other applications and, and possible solutions using Hydra. And then following up, as John mentioned, he'll talk about licensing information. Okay, so what is it? Hydra is essentially a multiplexing technology uh, specifically for RFID. Um, multiplexer, as most of you probably know, is just a device that selects a single signal path from a multiplicity of possible paths. So in this case, we're looking at getting energy, RF energy from a, an RFID reader out to multiple antennas. And the most readers will have more than one RF port, so they can typically switch between two to four ports. This is shown as having four ports. And then the multiplexer allows us to turn each one of those ports uh, into more than one antenna or connectivity to more than one antenna. Okay, that's, that's what this technology is in a nutshell, the, the uh, multiplexer part. And then the antenna I'll just uh, cover separately. So I'm gonna step back now and, and describe what drove us to needing uh, something like Hydra. So um, we have we introduced RFID on space station in uh, 2017. Um, the station has a, a very large um, amount for a spacecraft of usable stowage space. It uh, got to the point where the need for stowage uh, surpassed the available allotted stowage uh, space on station. And so ad hoc stowage areas were created. Um, that in combination with the fact that a lot of our 
our vessel for stowage, we would call cargo transfer bags or CTBs as shown here. They all look fairly similar. So it, it's pretty easy uh, for the crew to lose track of where a specific CTB is and which, which one is which. Uh, the onboard storage system is tracked with a database application, uh, it's called IMS, Inventory Management System. Uh, it tracks to date over about 400,000 items, um, around 13,000 are considered lost over the period of the years of life of station, which is a very long time. Not all those items are critical, but um, when a critical item does get lost, it makes for a bad day. So uh, historically, uh, the stowage processes on station have had a lot of human in the loop. So the crew follows procedures to move things around, um, and occasionally there's you know space not aligned where the ground controller thought there might be space, and so there's a improvisation by the crew, and then they would later call that down. Sometimes on the spot, typically it's later. Sometimes end of the day, occasionally end of the week. And so as you can imagine. There's uh, plenty of room for humans to introduce error, and all of this is driving the need, has driven the need for us to automate logistics management on our remote vehicles. So uh, the RFID technology that we adopted back in 2017 is the um, prevailing RFID standard used around the world. It's EPC uh, Global. It's based in the UHF spectrum, and it's a passive tag technology, meaning the tags do not have to have batteries. They respond by rectifying the incident RF energy uh, modulating and just reflecting it back to the reader. For our uh, operation on space station, all of that data is, is sent to the ground for processing. Um, we're in the process now, starting to move towards having the processing done on the vehicle, but for uh, the experimental stages, this has been very convenient. And we apply what we call a collectively complex event processing which is really machine learning algorithms to analyze the data uh, for and, and drive different inferences, chief of which in importance for us is location. So when we started off on this, you know, we realized that there's some key differences compared to the way that RFID technology had been used historically up to that point. This is, uh, you know, starting off the planning for this was in the 2012 to 2015 timeframe. Um, one of those major differences in the, is the fact that this is using RF signals in what is essentially a, a tin can. So you get all, this, all these reflections that in some cases help, in some cases hurt. Um, a lot of our cargo is stowed, stowed behind metal racks. This is going to be um, RF opaque. And then we get dense storage of things, uh, items stowed on top of items on top of items, which tends to obscure the signal and makes coverage difficult. So at the outset, we envision these three facets of the technology or the uh, introduction of RFID to try to overcome some of those hurdles. Uh, the realm one is your typical fixed reader, fixed antenna system. The antenna is denoted by uh, the red squares. We would have eight uh, antennas for to each of two readers in the instrumented modules. That's been flying since 2017. Um, realm two is a robotic free flyer equipped with RFID readers. And the antennas um, make it fly around, it extends our coverage area, and it also has a, a homing feature. Uh, and then realm three is basically like realm one with the same readers, but we just pipe that energy uh, into, uh, into racks, where, which would otherwise present an RF opaque barrier. Okay, those are the three building blocks. Mostly what we have in terms of use of hydro uh, correlates to realm one and realm three, and so we won't be talking about the robotic free flyer. Um, this just shows uh, wh where we have instrumentation in the space station. So the blue indicates the instrumented modules. Again, two readers and eight antennas in each of those modules with Realm 1. Uh, purple indicates where we get scattered energy in some coverage, not as good as, of course, in the blue modules. In green, we get very little energy. So with just the open, open air antennas, what we call Realm 1 again, um, this is a snapshot of how well we do. So. In the instrumented modules of the total tagged items, we see about 72%. Um, this pie chart graph simply indicates where the ones that we missed were, where they located. And so um, not a lot of cargo and metal racks in node one. Um, a lot of it is in the, uh, these, uh, what we call zero gravity stowage racks or ZSRs. Uh, those are textile uh, RF transparent um, racks. Um, but they're, they're stuck very tightly, and especially node one overhead four and node one starboard four, uh, the green and the light blue, 
Um, those are those contain our food, what we call Bob's bulk over at bags that have a lot of metal content on the foil food packages. So uh, very difficult for the outside antennas to see and, and read all those accurately. That that um, accounts for the majority of the missed items uh, in node one. Uh, so again, this is just with the, what we call the open air, the module um, antennas. And then, so that's one big metric for us. You know, how many items do we see out of the total that are there? And then the other is how well do we localize those? So uh, these graphs just show the RMS air in centimeters um, as a function of total populate, tag population fraction in both instrumented and non-instrumented modules. Uh, where our ground stowage officers would like to be and the crew would like to be is they want to be directed to rack level, or uh, which is a two meter high by one meter wide, one meter deep um, rack. Uh, if they can get into the right rack, they typically put their eyes on it. So we're typically good at that point for most items. There are some other items that are exception, and I'll uh, refer to those later. Um, so we do we get into that um, with the different algorithms for localizing. We In 2020, we converted from more conventional type of regressor algorithms to machine learning, and there's a pretty good uh, improvement that got us to about 40% uh, of our tag population inside of that cubic meter in the instrumented modules. Um, in the non-instrumented modules, we don't do as well as you might imagine, um, and we actually have a more, even more significant improvement when we went to machine learning. Machine learning could do a lot better in terms of reading these signals just from scattered energy and making sense of them compared to a human or some of the more classical algorithms that have been around for a long time. So those two, uh, location accuracy and, and total number of uh, reads, you know, read accuracy is what drove us to need something something different. This is just highlighting that. The green is where we want to be uh, below this dotted line here at the cubic meter, and uh, the, a lot of our tag population tails off. So, so the realm three part was to take a reader and introduce energy uh, into a into these racks directly, so we don't have uh, the obscuration from metallic structure or densely stacked items like we do with the food bulk over at bags or food bobs. So this was in the planning. Um, it just uh, launched last year. It was the last of the three facets of realm one, realm two, and realm three uh, to launch and get commissioned. Um, we typically get very high accuracy uh, with in placing antennas directly in these stowage areas. Um, but the one thing that we didn't know when we started off on this was that we would have this, this concept of, of using a multiplexer like Hydro that would afford us many more antennas than we ever anticipated. Okay, so that, that gets us to Hydra. Um, and, and again, the idea is that we, you know, with just machine learning and open air antennas, and we, you know, we get about 7% of the items and 40% within the ac location accuracy that we want, which really is not good enough, right? We're out at Mars or even on the surface, and the crew needs to find something. The fact that we can get 40% of those items uh, right away is, is just not good enough. So to close that gap, uh, we're really functioning on this very extensive multiplexing um, from each reader port. So, and, and this just kind of shows uh, what Hydra can do for us in that sense. Um, there are no power cables going to the Hydra nodes. All these blue blocks are uh, Hydra multiplexer or Hydra nodes, and the little triangles are antennas. Okay, so no uh, no power cables um, and no no control or command lines. It's just the RF cable. Um, that goes to each hydro node. Um, the hydro node self powers itself off a small fraction of that energy, and then it can further transmit that or relay to another hydro node or uh, to an antenna at any of these locations. And so, just the, the basic concept, and the concept was, uh, oh gosh, I think we we thought of, of this kind of thing in around 2019, and uh, it, 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 the concept very simple. It took um, quite a while to dig through or work through the devil in the details. Uh, but as I uh, described, the uh, RF energy um, is coupled off uh, inside of each node, uh, and it's rectified. It's a very small fraction of the power, so it's not really noticeable from uh, what's coming into what's going out. It, it allows that rectified power allows a microcontroller to control that node 
and then command internally switching to uh, here it's shown is just two output ports. Um, we've progressed since this point, but then it can transfer either over to another node or it can transfer out to an antenna. And so the, the key benefits of this, of course, there are other, you know, uh, multiplexes have been around a while. Um, some of the benefits, though, for us are extended coverage area with minimal infrastructure. So the fact that these are daisy chainable, um, we don't have to uh, have RF cable uh, going from one point to and, and traversing the same path that another cable did if we can just daisy chain it and just keep adding as we go. Um, through this process, you are you are using a little bit of power in H1, um, and, and so there is a, a little bit of loss. But the idea is that you're not radiating as much power. You're not trying to localize things using a higher power and reaching tags, say, you know, four to six meters away. Um, you're radiating a small amount of power with a local coverage cell that's smaller, but you got more of them. So even without the machine learning, um, you you tend to get better localization accuracy. It's um, designed to be reader agnostic and plug and play. So these Hydra nodes, there's no commanding from the reader in our preferred embodiment here. There's no commanding from the reader to the node that says, tells it when to switch. Okay, so as far as the antenna knows, it's, it's just another antenna or set of antennas out there. It has no idea how many you've got connected out there. It doesn't need to know. And then you can attach uh, other, other nodes on. Um, I'll talk about where we are with this, the plug and play feature. Um, and, and where we eventually want to go with that. Uh, I mentioned that this does allow us to get uh, lower mass um, in part because we're not using as many readers. So if we were to retrofit or, or to outfit the station um, to, to work that over again using Hydra, we would only use a single reader per module and everything else would just be extensions on Hydra nodes, um, lower cable mass, uh, and uh, reduce power and, and control cables required that would have to run to a reader or to other types of, uh, of multiplexes. Uh, so the, uh, yeah, uh, potential for reduced costs, um, extensible to storage volume surfaces, open air regions, and uh, easier, makes for easier fit in space vehicles, possibly some other applications too. So this is just uh, listing a few of the, some other features, some existing and some planned. Uh, right now we can put, we can pre-program different configurations in the Hydra nodes. You know, so depending on where they are in the network, um, they can function certain ways or sample, you know, antennas at, uh, for different dwell times. Uh, so that's, that's something we have working right now. Um, what we have planned are, ad hoc additions of new hydro chain. So let's say as it happened with our space station where, you know, when we got commercial crew cargo vehicles, we started getting up more cargo than was ever envisioned for space station. And so the created to come up with these new, wherever there's, you know, empty areas, uh, bays, um, they would create stowage areas uh, using bungee cables and, and cords and just holding the things in place. And so if that were to happen, the crew could conceivably just add another chain of hydro nodes and get some antennas back there and, you know, you're set. So that's a, the network discovery, you know, the system being able to automatically detect when new hydro nodes are added is something we're working. Another really uh, important uh, concept or, or facet of this that we're working is the scan rate or the sampling rate of these different antennas. So you can imagine that you've got different, um, you know, let's say you've got 40 to maybe even 100 antennas in one module. Um, the downside of this is if you've got a highly dynamic environment, and so let's say it's, it's daytime, the crew happens to be doing offloading of, of logistics from a visiting vehicle. Uh, if the system is off sampling, 80 antennas are deep in the rack, you know, you might sample each one of those antennas for a half a second or a second. Um, you can easily envision that you're going to miss things, you know, moving through the open environment. So the way that we plan to work that is to have the network designate certain critical antennas that are important during dynamic events that would be sampled much more rapidly. And then intermittently, it might hop into the racks to sample, or um, we might segregate into crew sleep uh, periods in these inactive states. And during those times, it does the deep dive and gets a really good audit of what's in all the racks. And then during the daytimes, it's hitting these open air, um, open region antennas uh, much more rapidly. 
so this is notionally uh, how we might in, um, envision outfitting a module. This this view here is a CAD representation of of the um, International Space Station Node One. Um, it's looking into the Russian FGB, uh, looking outward in Node One. Um, uh, the ones that the antennas that exist right now today are the the red uh, what we call Realm One antennas. There are eight of them, of which it looks like we see four in this picture. Five, um, and then we we also have a Hydra uh, implementation in this rack over here. This is Node One S four, and I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like in a minute. So we have we have twenty four antennas in that rack, and then um, eight in this module. Everything else is notional, but um, it just kind of uh, shows how we might think about it. Where we've got the blue block blocks are Hydra nodes, um, the yellow blocks are antennas that. Some of them may be out in the cabin uh, interior, but most of them would be um, either inside the rack or pushed up against the outer mold line of the, the spacecraft. And then we have, of course, the, the gray or the reader cables that extend over to hyper nodes and hubs. So uh, again, the daisy chain allows for minimal cable ru cable runs. And then, um, you know, in this context, like, again, if you have this many antennas, you're probably going to have a strategy on how often you're sampling antennas, which ones need to cover uh, dynamic activities. And, you know, so for this one, we probably like the, the red antennas, uh, the real one antennas, those are monitoring, you know, open air activities. So we probably have those sampled much more frequently. So uh, just a quick comparison to uh, other other approaches, right? So. The, the brute force approach is to not use any multiplexer. Um, you just have a number of antennas that matches up to the number of RF ports on your reader. Uh, one of the, of course, obvious disadvantages of this is that you know, your, your reader can only be in one place, and so you have these long cable runs, possibly retraversing the same uh, the same real estate to get to a, a further point. And then you're limited in terms of coverage areas. Those, of course, would define your coverage areas with four antennas. So again, RF8 multiplexers themselves are not new. Uh, this is just um, one of the older concepts where you've got uh, RF cables or the black lines. You have, uh, in this case, a single power control, which is both provided over ether. Um, if you had, and this is what that might look like if you had both uh, RF cables black, uh, separate control, which is blue lines, and a, a power connect, uh, connection to each each multiplexer node, um, it gets uh, pretty messy pretty fast. Uh, more recently, um, there, there are now available multiplexers that have the uh, signal, command signal run over the RF cable as well as a, a DC power over that cable. Uh, they're not daisy chainable, um, so you would still have, you possibly have a lot of emanating cable from a single hub uh, to antennas. Uh, the other important thing is that these are commanded by the reader. So the reader is commanding this node when to switch, uh, which means it's not going to be reader, typically not going to be a reader agnostic. Um, it is also the time required for the reader to do that commanding and, and you know, waiting for the antenna to switch. Uh, so with the Hydra system, again, the, there's only RF, there's no DC, there's no command signal. Um, separated command signal that goes along that RF cable. You can issue commands, the reader can issue commands to these hybrid nodes. It's done over the RF channel. Um, so uh, that um, that is possible in, our, in the preferred state of this though, we try to avoid that simply because other, other than change, if we wanna change a um, commanding like the uh, dwell time say on antennas or change the configuration, we're adding another chain on it. Otherwise, we just want the reader to just do its thing and be totally unaware of what is out there. Um, it's just switching through these ports and then the hydro nodes do all the commanding to switch to different antennas or different nodes. The, uh, we've tested up to four levels deep in terms of hydro nodes um, and that's with a one watt reader output. Um, And, and and that yeah, there can be uh, changes to that. We haven't tested there. I know there's some readers that operate at two watts. Uh, the current hydro nodes, um, we haven't tested those at two watts. It would probably require uh, some changes for that. 
So it, the, I think the, it, it warrants a little discussion about how the plug and play is achieved because we don't, again, we don't have the reader in, in nominal operations. We don't have the reader just talking to the hydro nodes and telling them when to switch. So the reader's just doing its thing. And in a conventional example, it looks like, you know, the reader's uh, reading these EPCs and then it does a, an RF port switch and it starts reading EPCs again. And in that CSV file or the file that's coming back, the data file, you would have the antenna port and then all of the other data, metadata that goes along with it, the signal strength, uh, which antenna, which, uh, which frequency. Um, the hydro example, so the reader's still gonna do its thing. It's still gonna be switching RF ports, but the hydro nodes are sending back specific EPCs that are part of that hydro instrumentation. Those EPCs tell at the back end of the system uh, on the um, processing side, which antenna is reading the EPCs that are to come until you get to the next antenna EPC, which means that it's switched. And now the next set of antennas or next set of EPC tags read were read by that antenna. That's what allows it to be um, reader agnostic. Uh, these are the type of hydro nodes uh, that we have um, either in flight right now, which would be the first two. Um, these are the ones that are flying now. We have a one by three and a one by four. Um, at that time, we distinguished between a node that would only connect to other hydro nodes, we call it a junction node, versus a, an antenna node, which would connect uh, either to other antenna nodes or to, um, uh, or to antennas. Uh, we decided to do, um, probably break away from that. We, we have a one by six now that we're testing. Um, it's got, of course, more output ports and we've done away with the junction node versus antenna node. Um, these can connect to either antennas or other hybrid nodes. And then we're also, uh, we're in the early stage, prototype stage of a one by 12. Um, for our foreseeable future, the concepts of operations we have right now, we don't really have, we don't see a need uh, to have more than 12 output ports, although it, it's, uh, it's certainly possible if there was a need for that. Um, so in this mix, this, uh, over the last 12 months, we started getting requests to infuse this technology into some of our ground uh, in test beds and laboratories. And it became apparent that for that, for us really to optimize that infusion, we needed to get the cost down. I mean, these, these ones made for flight are over-designed. Um, it's difficult to replace once they're, once they're lodged up, so they're over-designed. To have uh, features, more protective features, uh, tighter EMI, and, and so um, it makes them more expensive. I think, I think, like for flight purposes, these probably they probably cost us about a thousand dollars a piece for these. Um, we just started this working this unit here. Our target is like three hundred and twenty dollars for this one by six, and again, that's in pretty low, uh, pretty low quantities compared to what you have on the commercial side. We're talking about. Hundreds of these things were in a, you know, um, in a commercial scale, of course, that cost could uh, most likely go quite a bit below that. Okay, so uh, looking a little bit at Hydra on the space station, um, this is the Node 1 S4, it's a, a shot um, from space station, um, this rack over here, Node 1 S4, it's got four quadrants. Uh, there, it's a textile rack. Um, the doors are currently off of it right now. They're also textile. Uh, you can see that each one has three stowage spaces separated by these two shelf liners. The hydro system is actually behind these liners. Um, so we have, uh, I'll show you a picture of what's behind the liner, but we have a total of uh, six antennas in each one of these quadrants. Uh, so for a total of 24, which is, and that's with just using two reader ports. Um, by comparison, the rest of the Realm 1 system in the the three nodes, the open air antennas have a total of 24 antennas, so a greatly increased number of antennas. It is it is fairly over instrumented, and in most cases we wouldn't need that many antennas uh, inside of a single rack. Uh, but one of the reasons we did that is we wanted to get a a really good test in the flight environment of this chained hydro network. We wanted to be able to stack uh, the hydro nodes into this network and verify that they work the way that they're supposed to. So this is just a picture inside of, uh, of one of those quadrants. Um, these are the, the black boxes, the hydro nodes, and uh, the junction nodes you can't quite see. It's uh, out of the screen um, in this picture. Uh, these, um, these are the one by three 
uh, hybrid nodes, um, we're only using two of the antenna ports instead of three on these. Um, and again, we use more nodes than we needed to just because we wanted to test this cascading of hydro nodes. Um, so with, uh, again, there are six antennas in here. Like if we're using the new hydro node and wanted to put this many antennas, we just use a uh, probably a single one by six to cover all the antennas in here. Uh, and this is the antenna. So this I'm going to talk about the antenna a little bit more, but, it, you know, for us in this um, where launch uh, mass has a huge cost associated with it and not to mention the fact that we've only got so much livable space for the crew that the size of the antenna and the mast antenna um, are very critical uh, to reduce those so um, that's that was the motivation for getting a small antenna to use with hydra otherwise the hydra nodes can work with any typical rfid antenna um, doesn't have to be these little hydra node antennas and so, so that brings us into the, the antenna itself um, Again, like the motivation was, you know, to get this uh, really, really small, um, low mass antenna. Um, we this actually follows a series of developments um, based on a, a new type of RFID antenna, including the ones that are flying up there now. They just we just didn't try to optimize for mass and size on those initial ones. Um, this the one shown here is isn't actually what we call HU26. It's very very similar. Um, HU26 looks like this, and, um, in fact, it was the one shown in the previous picture. Uh, it was designed from a combination of a thin print circuit board on top of conductive and insulating fabrics. And, and the overall mass of that was like 1.2 ounces, so it was a super light. It um, suffered a little bit in um, manufacturability, uh, was the textile parts of that antenna required. Uh, some detailed manufacturing. And so partly because of that, partly because of that antenna works well on non-conductive surfaces like that rack that I showed you, the textile rack, it, um, it, it's a little bit more difficult when you put it against a metal body. And where we're taking hydro, we want to be able to mount antennas all over the vehicle structure racks as well as, as possibly the outer shell. And so um, we, we are uh, extending this design to accommodate that, but just to and I don't want to don't want to put anybody to sleep, so I uh, won't go too much into the antennas. Um, but I am happy to answer questions. Love to talk antennas if anybody has any questions at the end. But so this is the uh, the original Rebel one antenna. It's the one that, as you can see this picture here, there are uh, um, 24 of these on station today, and these are actually. Uh, they employ a similar part of, of the technologies in the, the smaller HU26, um, and they're a comparable reduction from most uh, modern RFID antennas uh, reduction in size. So this is about 80% volume reduction compared to one of the most popular commercial antennas. And I'll just discuss briefly how, how we did that. And then HU26 is a further extension of, of essentially the same technology. So when we're talking to a tag, the polarization of a tag, you think of the way it's aligned, when it communicates, is linear. So it's either going to be point and vertical or horizontal or some orientation in between. On the that's on the tag side. On the reader side, ideally you want to match that so it'd be linear to linear. If you go vertical or horizontal, you have infinite power loss and you can't talk to that tag. If you're somewhere in between, then you lose power, but you can still talk to it. That's kind of the, the rough overview. So how, how do you get around um, this polarization loss when you talk to tags? The, the most common approach is to use a, what's called a circularly polarized antenna on the reader side. It, it essentially means instead of just being fixed linear, it's rotating. Okay, so it's rotating, but your tag's still linear, and so you end up losing half the power. It's kind of a compromise. Yeah, I lose half the power, but at least I don't lose the link ever most of the time, um, unless it just happens to be that 50% loss of power just happens to make the difference. Um, but uh, but actually, so it's 50% each way. So you lose 50% going to the tag and another 50% coming back. So overall, you end up losing 75% of the RF power. Okay, so the, um, the frequency at any given time that this protocol uses is, is very narrow. So you can see here, it might, it, the overall frequency spans from 902 to 928 megahertz. Instantaneously, it's using one of 50 channels. So it'd be this one single channel. The FCC requires it to hop around 
um, through all of these frequencies for the sake of coexistence with other wireless systems. So now the antenna um, has to not only accommodate each channel, it has to accommodate the whole whole range. When you add spectrum to antennas, they they require greater bandwidth, they get larger. Okay. So when we make a circular polarized antenna that has to cover all those bands, um, circular polarized antenna is going to require what we call modes. Uh, each mode has to cover that whole range, which means we have a larger antenna and we're still losing the 75% round trip power just from the polarization mismatch. So what we came up with is let's, let's make use of this frequency hopping rather than just accommodate and say, oh, we have, the antenna has to cover the whole bit. We have two modes that each covers, say, half of that. Because the because that band is narrow, the antenna is smaller. We can make the antenna smaller. Um, in addition, um, each of these separate modes is result in a linear polarization. When they add, it slowly tilts. So it's linear, but it's variable linear, depending on which of these channels the reader is on at any time. In the end, it means whatever, this would be the polarization of the tag on the bottom, the reader on the top. At some arbitrary tag location, the reader on the right channel or range of channels is going to be have an optical polarization match to that tag, uh, eliminating a large part of that 75% polarization mismatch. Okay, so the downside of that is, and, and there is something you have to be careful about. Um, so this reader is hopping around through these different frequencies. If you're using a circular polarized antenna, yes, you get that 75% round trip uh, polarization loss. But you're getting that all the time. So if you have a high, highly dynamic situation where a tag is moving rapidly through the field of view, you may not be able to wait for the antenna to say it does cycle through quickly, but it may not be quick enough going through these frequencies. So that's something you have to consider. On the other hand, if it's stowed logistics and it's just sitting there, um, then this is going to get you typically a better penetration and find a polarization that reduces that loss uh, to where you get uh, you can read more tags. So this is just kind of highlighting uh, the bottom one here is the run one antenna. It uses the same, we call it a uh, uh, switched or not switched, but a um, uh, agile frequency polarization. Um, it uses that, it wasn't optimized for size. We didn't really press it to get the size down. It, compared to a, a larger panel commercially available uh, antenna, um, yes, it's smaller, it's about 80% of the volume, but we. Hadn't really pressed it until more recently when we developed this Hydra antenna, the antenna we use with Hydra, that as you can see here is even a, a further decrease in size. The bottom one's about five inch square. This one's something like two and three quarters by three and a half inch. Um, and so we've got evolutions of that. Um, we've done a little work on reducing, um, you know, the Hydra node mass. Not a whole lot yet. Uh, we had a, a research arm that was going off and looking at printed materials, um, this 3D printed copper filament that we did in conjunction with Marshall Space Flight Center and an external research center. I was able to get that down to about 66 grams from 145 for conventional aluminum. Uh, the conductivity is a, a little bit low uh, for this application, so that's still in work. The most important thing for us, though, is the antenna. You have many more antennas than you do hydro nodes. So um, that was that was the, the big game changer. So that's the uh, overview of Hydra. Um, I, you know, in talking with some commercial groups and uh, other users of RFID, I, I think there's some probably very likely candidates. Uh, some of the ones that mirror closely what we're doing would be, of course, aerospace uh, in cargo holds of, of uh, commercial or uh, yeah, commercial aviation uh, aircraft. Um, enclosed vehicles. I know there are some efforts in uh, delivery uh, enterprises where you're trying to read inside of the inside of the cargo areas. You've got dense logistics, right? So a highly multiplexed antenna system uh, might do very well for that. Uh, possibly other areas in, in manufacturing and some of these other areas might also have uh, have applications. Um, the one I wanted to come back to, you know, I mentioned early on that we're, you know, we've been for the most part targeting this um, cubic meter accuracy that gets our crew to eyes on site. Um, we just started extending this uh, autonomous logistics management to the medical arena, and there are um, it, there's interest in getting resolution cell down to four six inch cube, and uh, 
I think that with this kind of hybrid technology in the past, we would not have probably sacrificed every report to go do that. Um, this makes it, I think, fairly straightforward to drop a line down, expand to, to the medical device area, uh, proliferate using Hydra across a shelf, and have this really high fidelity, um, fine resolution tracking capability. Um, also, uh, dropping a line down into a trash receptacle to have a trash processing capability. There's a lot of these things that uh, allow for finer level tracking. It just, um, in the past, for us, it hasn't been feasible uh, because we didn't want to sacrifice um, our efforts to do that. Okay. So I think that is uh, the end of what I have. And um, I think John is going to take it back over and then um, and we'll, I think, have questions afterwards. Great, thank you, Pat. I I appreciate it. It, it, uh, uh, it it's always nice when we get to to host these and and uh, learn even more about the technology, especially when the presenter is so articulate, such as yourself. And so we we really appreciate your time. But but thank you, thank you very very much. Um, I, I should tell those that are in attendance uh, that we have received numerous questions regarding the presentation or the material in the presentation. And we'll get to them shortly, uh, but first, just a brief interview of uh, overview, excuse me, of NASA's technology transfer process. So to access technologies like. Like both of the ones that were described in and in, in, uh, wonderfully in this webinar, such as the hyper distributed RFID antenna. So the hydro system and then the low mass antenna technology to which Pat uh, uh, just spoke to. You can search for those at NASA's uh, uh, technology transfer portal, and this is at uh, technology.nasa.gov. And uh, all of these patented technologies are listed here uh, under the patent portfolio tab. So you'll see that NASA has, uh, you know, quite a few patents available and a lot of different categories. Um, and uh, and just a reminder that that uh, that you know each NASA uh, you know research and flight center uh, a lot of them have specialties and will feature uh, technologies uh, that adhere to that specialty. But uh, fortunately, we've got a lot of the RFID tech here, and uh, and we could speak to those because there's quite a bit of uh, of uh, uh, commercial opportunities. Uh, for this particular uh, technology. So, okay, so thank you everyone that submitted a question. So feel free to continue submitting your questions by typing them into the chat box. So uh, a quick note, uh, if we don't get to all the submitted questions today, and it doesn't look like we, we will, then we will follow up with you uh, afterwards uh, by email. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, and uh, read some of the questions from our audience members, Pat. Uh, so let's see here. Okay, first question. Uh, so do you have to balance the cable run redundancy uh, versus radio frequency loss? So having the power uh, or having, having the power uh, by adding in daisy chains or splitters? Yeah, you do have to uh, account, you know, there's a, a, a balance in managing the power. Um, the propagation loss is, uh, one, of course, one over R squared in a free space environment. It's, it's a little bit different in a tin can, but it's, you know, say for the sake it's one over R squared. Um, we're getting, you know, it's on the Hydra uh, nodes somewhere between one and a half and two dB of the insertion loss, um, probably a little bit of room for improvement on that. But so you can go down several stages of hydrogen, be it say 4 dB, 5 dB uh, insertion loss, and that's a lot less than the radiative loss from point A to point B. Um, and again, the um, the idea basically is that instead of like for us transmitting four to six meters away uh, and ramping up the power to make that happen and get good penetration into the cargo, that yeah, we have a, a lower power, we're radiating lower power after the chain of hydro nodes, but it gets the power there. It's actually less lost than the one over R squared power for these short distances. It's very long distance at some point, the um, exponential losses to an RF cable will exceed the one over R squared, but for these high distances, the, the cable loss is less. 
And then because of this, the lower power, you're actually getting smaller resolution cells, which makes it easier to localize and takes for us a little bit of burden off of the machine learning. Okay, great, great, great. Uh, thank you, thank you. And if Pat, you would advance the slide. Uh, uh, yeah, that'd be great. Oh, perfect, perfect, thank you. Um, okay, uh, next question. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, this particular uh, audience member has uh, heard a lot about the developments uh, of, of uh, similar configurations that use multiplexers where several antennas are connected. Um, but uh, what they're curious about is, is if it's a, uh, a, a slow system. So the question boils down to uh, this, and that is, uh, does the Hydra system compromise reading speed? I didn't catch the last word there, John. Reading uh, what? Uh, does the Hydra system compromise reading speed? Yes, yes, it does. Um, in the sense that, so any multiplexer system, right? You're going from a single RF port on the reader to uh, instead of one antenna, you're going to many antennas, and you're going to dwell for some finite amount of time on each antenna. So to that extent, anytime you're using a multiplexer. Uh, you're you're going to slow down the time it takes to sample all those, or increase the time it takes to sample, you know, all the antennas that you have in your constellation. Um, so that's like that's definitely a consideration, and, and why, and we're just kind of getting into that now because you know we have it installed on station in one of our racks. Um, that rack is we put it in that rack because it's one of the busier racks. It's got the food right, you know, the crews. Um, the one thing they're going to do every day is eat, right? Just like everybody else. So uh, that was our target point. Um, but they're still not in there all the time. It's not a hugely dynamic environment. And so we right now we're sampling it on 15 minute intervals, um, which is fine for that. But again, if you're out in an open region where you have things moving through very rapidly, then yes, you absolutely have to consider how much time you're taking to to go through the different parts of the node, and you probably very likely may want to consider an asymmetric sampling of the antennas in the constellation for that reason. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, next question is, um, can this system bring in a signal impedance signal uh, from a sensor instead of an RFID signal bandwidth only, or maybe using the multiplexer could this system bring in multiple impedance signals from a sensor array configuration? So that's a really interesting question. And I, I think I understand what's being asked. You know, there are some like RFID sensors that ch impedance changes in response to some external stimulus. Uh, that is probably possible. I, we hadn't really thought too much about that. We've worked with those kinds of sensors before. What we what we um, are doing is using um, RFID sensors that have um, uh, data buses attached to the integrated circuit, right? And so uh, these would be primarily I squared C. We've done some spy buses, and we attach sensors to those. Um, we didn't really get into that. It's a different technology that we have that's licensable. Um, some specific implementations of that. And I've done actually we're, we're fly we're flying some um, three axis accelerometer found on RFID tags. Having said that, we have not gotten to test uh, talking to those sensor tags. We can get their ID. We haven't um, gone into the more uh, in depth tag actions that are required to pull data off the tag through a hybrid chain. Um, but we think it's possible. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, uh... Pat, can you tell us, uh, and this again stems from a, uh, an audience member question, um, how you would include a, let's say, an, uh, how would you include item temperature uh, using an RFID tag? Yeah, so that would be, you know, uh, I think that segues well from the last question. Um, the offerings now that are commercially available uh, for RFID integrated circuits that have uh, have a data bus in which you can attach an, a, a microcontroller and then attach low power sensors. Um, 
the, those tend to work really well for low power, low data rate types of, types of sensing applications. Um, for some of those, if the power is low enough, uh, you can do that on um, completely harvested energy. And then other times, um, you you can add a small coin cell. The, the three axis accelerometer sensors that we're finding, we're using those as motion sensors. So when the crew opens and closes the door, that RFID tag then records the time that that event happened. Um, we can pull that data and send it to the ground. It provides more context for the machine learning and understanding where items went at a fine resolution. So uh, you see an item in the environment, it disappears from the RFID view, but then you get this motion event from a sensor tag on a door and that gives context that the item went into that door. Um, that, that sensor required a small coin cell battery, but um, other types uh, may not. Um, we've tested temperature, pressure, humidity, and other types of, of um, sensors that fall into that ultra low power paradigm. Okay, all righty. And it looks like we have uh, a time for for uh, one more question. So my apologies to to those of you that have submitted questions, and we hadn't gotten to all of them. Um, but uh, there is the 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 next one. Uh, that was in line um, uh, relates to agriculture. So, um, uh, can you can you discuss the 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 um, the application uh, of this technology uh, in in the use of uh, perhaps either grading produce in agriculture or uh, or its ability to to collect information. On uh, on let's say the the type uh, of agriculture, if it's uh, you know produce being grown, um, can you see uh, a, a an application uh, for this particular technology in agriculture? Oh, I think that for this technology, um, you want to probably think of scenarios in which getting better penetration into your target tags that might otherwise be obscured uh, and, and achieving that through a proliferation of antennas and or getting better localization accuracy afforded through this large number of antennas. Those would be the types of applications that I would I would target uh, primarily. Um, you know, I, I hadn't thought too much about tracking whether it's people or humans, but, um, you know, so it's probably not too hard to imagine though that if you wanted better resolution uh, in terms of tracking an object that's moving around, like having more antennas typically lends well to that. Again, with the constraints that we discussed about timing um, and how you have to consider how fast the target's moving through each field of view. Um, it, possibly some of the other other uh, agriculture applications might be better suited for some of the RFID sensors, sensors being the ones that you would attach to a tag, temperature, pressure, humidity, that type. Okay. Um, hopefully that answered the question. Okay. All righty. Uh, Pat, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for those that uh, have attended. We, we at least want to be able to give you a minute or two back from the hour so you can, uh, you know, uh, move on to your uh, uh, next, uh, uh, you know, work related, uh, perhaps meeting. Um, but uh, again, if we didn't get to your question during the Q&A session, when you registered, uh, we we're able to capture your email address. Uh, so we'll follow up with you uh, within uh, about uh, a business week or so. Um, but please feel free to email us at the address on the screen uh, with uh, with anything additional uh, inquiries, uh, especially if it's uh, also license related. Um, but uh, and we'll be we'll be more than happy to to, to speak to you. Uh, we do have some contact information. Uh, the QR codes on here uh, lend themselves to. Um, uh, some articles on our NASA Tech Transfer Program website uh, that will discuss the technology a little bit further. But those uh, those documents also have links to uh, um, inquire about licensing uh, these technologies as well. So, uh, but thank you again. We really appreciate you taking time uh, to be with us today. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Pat. We re very much appreciate your time and uh, all your great uh, uh, innovations. My name is JC Hernandez, and on behalf of NASA Johnson Space Center and our fantastic technology transfer agency team, keep innovating. Uh, have a great rest of the day.
Thanks, John. Appreciate it.